We uh, had an epileptic son who was not, uh, not diagnosed right away. He was kind of a, a mystery child for many people. And we said, okay, medicine has done what it could. And we lived with that for, for nine years, but it was in fact nine years of hell. And at that point, somebody told us about neurofeedback. Turns out that he responded profoundly. But still, it seems like even after our 25 years of involvement in this field, nearly 25 years of involvement, um, the, the mainstream world of neurology, psychiatry, psychology, and uh, general medicine uh, re really haven't caught on to this. And it's largely a matter of the bioelectrical domain, not the, do not the domain of biochemistry. The, bio, uh, the biochemical domain is basically uh, sets the background for this activity, but the real activity, uh, which is of importance to the brain, uh, involves matters uh, that are in the realm of timing and frequency, which is very fast phenomena. The brain ultimately makes decisions very fast and has to be capable of acting very fast. Not, you know, so it's not just a matter of how much dopamine you have in your brain, it's a question of how the brain controls itself in the moment. All right, now, this is Siegfried Othmer. He's a physicist by training, and I'll, I'll just turn it over to him for some more on neurofeedback. Okay, I'm Siegfried Othmer, uh, trained as a physicist, but I had an epileptic son, uh, and my wife uh, was uh, trained in neurophysiology at Cornell. Uh, we're both Cornell grads, and uh, uh, we... Uh, had an epileptic son who was not, uh, not diagnosed right away. He was kind of a, a mystery child for many people until very clearly epileptic phenomena uh, surfaced, at, at which point uh, the pediatrician suspected a neurological involvement, started him on anticonvulsants. Wonderful things happened, and we said, okay, the paradigm became, okay, epilepsy. And uh, eventually he saw a very famous neurologist in Los Angeles, uh, John Menkes, and he ultimately agreed with the diagnosis. Uh, but it turns out the picture was really much more complex. Uh, it, wasn't a, it wasn't just temporal lobe epilepsy, it was also what would now be identified as Asperger's, it was, now, uh, it was also what would now be identified as bipolar disorder. He was depressed, he was suicidal, he was paranoid. Uh, it was actually a much bigger issue. But the paradigm was, okay, we understood this as temporal lobe epilepsy, we did what we could, the anticonvulsants did what they could. Uh, uh, this was back in uh, many years ago when Tegretol was an experimental drug, did wonders for him. And uh, basically when that was done, when medicine was done, when John Menkes was done, we said, okay, medicine has done what it could. And we lived with that for, for nine years, but it was in fact nine years of hell. And at that point, somebody told us about neurofeedback. And uh, we uh, felt at that time, we'd struck out on a number of therapies, uh, but we felt obligated to try the things that made sense to us. And since new, uh, Sue's, uh, my wife's background was in neurophysiology, this made sense to her, so we're certainly gonna try it. That didn't mean we were in the boat, that made, just meant we, went, uh, we, were, we felt obligated to try things that made sense. Turns out that he responded profoundly. He, uh, he became uh, much more positive with regard to human, human interactions. Up to that time, no human interaction, interaction, including with his parents, was positive for him. Uh, he had no friends, and he really didn't know how he fit into this world. And it was really worse than Asperger's. He, he really couldn't relate to people. All that changed. He became very positive toward contact with people. He started making friends. He was almost giddy about making friends. Uh, he started uh, making eye contact, started uh, talking you know, at great length to his, his mother after school. Uh, his life was transformed. There's no question about this being a placebo effect, no question about our having uh, simply improved our parenting skills, uh, none of that. There, this was transformational on his part. So we were confronted with a problem, what, what's going on here? So we were amazing, you know, we were just intrigued by what was going on here. Not only were we seeing our son Brian change before our eyes, but when we were taking him to this clinic, 
we were seeing what, what was happening to other people. I said, wait a minute, we can't dismiss this. This is, this is major. And how come doesn't, the world doesn't know about this? Uh, this work was happening in Beverly Hills, which was in the virtual shadow of UCLA Medical School. And, uh, and yet, we'd never heard of this. Uh, this was 1985. And so, uh, within a matter of months, we decided to get into this field. I with my skills as an instrument developer, and uh, my wife with her knowledge about neuro neurophysiology. Uh, we were con convinced that this was important and obviously nobody else was paying attention so why shouldn't we pay attention? So uh, we did, we developed an instrument and uh, the instrument is still being sold uh, now a good many years later. It's still the state of the arts uh, system and um, took us about three years in development and then we said we had the thing sitting in our living room and we said now what? Uh, it says when you have the, the better mousetrap the world will beat a path to your door but the fact is, the world still didn't know about neurofeedback. So uh, we started training professionals, and uh, this happened in the early 90s, and we've by now trained about 5,000 professionals uh, around the world in about 42 different countries. And this work is now being done uh, around the world, essentially, in most of the, uh, the, you know, the uh, more developed countries. Um, but still, it seems like even after our 25 years of involvement in this field, nearly 25 years of involvement, um, the, the mainstream world of neurology, psychiatry, psychology, and uh, general medicine uh, re really haven't caught on to this. And the reason, of course, is that there's a real paradigm shift involved. It's, it's not just a question of solving our son's problem or some, some other such problems. Uh, the, the fact is that what is required to come to terms with neurofeedback is a fundamentally different new understanding uh, of um, the, the way the brain organizes mental activities, the brain, how the brain uh, organizes its own affairs, uh, implements self-regulation, and so forth. And that is now coming to be understood, and it's largely a matter of the bioelectrical domain, not the, do, not the domain of biochemistry. The, bio, uh, the biochemical domain is basically uh, sets the background for this activity, but the real activity, uh, which is of importance to the brain, uh, involves matters uh, that are in the realm of timing and frequency, which is very fast phenomena. The brain ultimately makes decisions very fast and has to be capable of acting very fast. Not, you know, so it's not just a matter of how much dopamine you have in your brain, it's a question of how the brain controls itself in the moment. So inevitably, the world of science has to come to terms with the bioelectrical domain of brain function. This we're now doing, and we're doing it with a technique that very actively engages that process through feedback. So, very simply then, the brain is looking at our feedback signal, which reflects its own activity, in the very way that it rela uh, relates to other, uh, other things in the environment. The brain back basically acts into the world, and then response to the world's response to the world. So think of, uh, think of how we drive a car. When we drive a car, uh, the car becomes in a sense part of us. And the, the brain uh, assumes the car is really part of us. It assumes responsibility for the whole car, not only for us, as, as we're driving the car. And so the brain is acting into the world through the car and, and then uh, reacts to the, you know, to the consequences. So the brain it needs to be thought of in this way as an, as an acting agency, uh, acting into the world and seeing the world's response. And when we, when we show the brain its own activity, it does the same thing. It sees itself as an agent. And it witnesses that activity and says, okay, I did that. And so it reacts to that uh, information that we give it on its own activity uh, in, a, in a way that makes it very clear the brain assumes ownership of that signal. It, it knows that signal relates to itself. It recognizes that and acts upon that signal. So that makes the process work. And, uh, and so we simply give information to the brain about its own activities and it acts upon that information. And when we bias that information toward better control, because we know where better control lies, we gradually maneuver the brain into better states of regulation. And this is a broad reality, not a trivial reality, not a simple reality. This is a broad reality that, goes, that uh, cuts across all domains of function of which the brain is in charge. 
uh, from managing the emotions, from managing, uh, managing executive function, cognitive function, managing our motor control, uh, managing our sense of the body, our sense of pain, it's all under dynamic control. It's all under dynamic regulation. And uh, this, is, this is the frontier and it's no, no, no surprise that uh, the world should react to that with some skepticism. Because as a matter of fact, we're, we're opening up the domain of mental health precisely in those areas that have been particularly intractable to us. And that would be bipolar disorder, uh, schizophrenia, traumatic brain injury, PTSD, and the personality disorders, addiction, and dementias. So the very toughest problems that are being confronted in the domain of mental health are coming under our management uh, to a useful degree. It's not like resol we resolve all these issues, but we make useful inroads into the most intractable mental health issues that we currently confront. And that's been accomplished now over a period of 20 years. And it's, it's happened essentially without NIH support. It's happened without the involvement of uh, most standard uh, you know, brain researchers and so forth because they've been off thinking in terms of pharmacology. Pharmacology has taken all the air in the room. We understand that. But that's a very limited agenda. There are a very limited set of pharmacological interventions, the principal ones, and uh, there's a limited amount that they can do. The story really lies, the story of mental health really lies in the bioelectrical domain and the domain of timing and frequency. And that's the domain which we've had to, to plumb essentially to ourselves uh, in the last uh, 25 years. Now, uh, psychiatry is dealing with things like RTMS, deep brain stimulation, uh, vagal stimulators, and so forth. They don't begin to touch what we can do with neurofeedback. Uh, 